Good, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, very glad to open uh, this uh, meeting of our uh, research seminar. It's a second time in a row that we moved to English after the exclusion for some way that we had with uh, the Corona crisis, uh, moving more to discussion, inner discussions. Unfortunately, we have our guest uh, only through a virtual guest and not coming here in person. Uh, our guest today, uh, Tim Odlin, was due to come uh, in uh, previous semester and we had to uh, cancel that or postpone that. We are very happy that he is willing to visit us today virtually in this, in this talk. And we hope that in the future, we can have the opportunity of uh, meeting him here in person and uh, this, having not only the talk, but also more discussions and informal discussions once the uh, crisis is over. And Tim Odlin is a professor of, oh, sorry, and another thing about uh, this meeting. So this meeting is part of our uh, Barilele series in uh, uh, what we do together for a very, it's a very long collaboration uh, between uh, the Van Leer Institute in, of Jerusalem, the Edesha Center of the Hebrew University and the Khan Institute. And uh, so this year we moved to the virtual realm and we have a uh, team modeling with a professor of philosophy at, at the New York University is mainly interested in foundational physics, metaphysics, and logics uh, among his books. We, I should mention the quantum non-locality and relativity, which appeared in the first edition, uh, truth and paradoxes, the metaphysics within physics, uh, philosophy of physics in two volumes, one on space and time, and the other on quantum theory. And as you can see, this quite range of interest in metaphysics of, and physics, and the also interest in the nature of probability, which will be the uh, topic of the work today. Uh, Tim would speak with uh, Ori Belkin, who is, uh, will be a commentator. Ori is a senior lecturer at our institute, at the Kohn Institute and he works on the philosophy of uh, physics and especially um, on, two, on different uh, ideas, one connection to space, time, and connections in the more modern view of these uh, questions. And the other is a, lo a lot of interest in the philosophy of the 17th century on uh, natural philosophy of the 17th century, especially Newton, but not only. So I will uh, let uh, Tim start our uh, talk and then uh, start his talk, of course. And you are, if I understood correctly, you are, you can ask questions during the talk. And if you feel not very easy to do that, you can do, derive your question to me and I will uh, raise them uh, up, uh, of course, with the, in the chat. So uh, please, Tim. Hey, thank you. Thank you and thanks everybody for not coming out for this. Um, so this is going to be a kind of uh, funny talk in, in a couple of ways. Let me, let me just set things up a little bit. Um, oh, first, let me just say about the way I, I prefer always in giving talks um, not to go on uninterrupted for you know, 45 minutes, an hour, and then have questions, because it always strikes me that that if a question arises in the first 10 or 15 minutes and people don't understand what I'm saying or it just sounds so idiotic that you can't imagine that's what I really mean, um, then you just have to sit there for half an hour and you're distracted from everything else. And, um, and, and so I, I much prefer not to break things up into a presentation and a question session, but just take questions as they come up. Um, just because probably if anybody can't follow what I said. Other people can't either. Um, so uh, it's easier in live because then I can just tell you to throw a rock at me or something to interrupt me. But um, it's a little harder online. Maybe if you raise your 
virtual hand or just you know shout out. Um, I'll, 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 I'll try and take questions as I go along. The other thing about this talk is that it, in a way it's on foundations of really two different topics. One is probability or objective chance and the other is credence or belief. Um, and I was, I was, it was suggested to me that this is not something that maybe a lot of people have looked into and that I should try and, 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 and lay things out in a very basic manner. Now, the really great thing about this is that I don't know really anything much about it at all. Um, I'm not sitting here, you know, from, from, a, from a standpoint of broad familiarity with the literature. If anything, there's probably stuff I just am completely unfamiliar with. Um, so how in the world did I get into this and what am I gonna do? In a way I got into it because I, I made a comment in a graduate seminar last year about uh, the right way to understand the nature of credence. And it's a, 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 as you'll see rather iconoclastic idea. And Hartree Field who was sitting in in the class was very sympathetic to it. He thought it was also in the right ballpark and he thought about things like that but had not really developed them into papers. And so Hartree asked me if I'd be interested in co-teaching a graduate seminar on the topic. And so I agreed to that, not really knowing at all beyond this kind of rather vague idea what I wanted to say. And, and then in the process, I sort of worked things out and the result is this paper I think I sent around. It's way too long to go through. It sort of has to cover everything. Um, but it does mean that everything is done from kind of zero. And, and all of these problems I'm gonna raise and some of the terminology, it's all new to me as well. So uh, hopefully this will be very basic and comprehensible to everybody. But nonetheless, I'm gonna argue um, fairly radical. The, th the third point before I start is that there is a much larger project that I've been engaged in for literally decades that, that this is a natural adjunct to. And that project has been trying to eliminate numbers um, from physics. Uh, that is, there, there, there is such a thing as number theory and there, there are numbers and you can find out by arguments, various quite interesting properties of numbers and there are different number fields and so on, but the universe, the physical universe itself is not a numerical object. It does not have in itself directly a numerical structure. Um, I mean, it's said that Pythagoras said things like a horse is the number 10. And I just literally have no idea what he could have possibly have had in mind by a claim like that. Um, Nonetheless, what's happened historically is that although in ancient Greece, mathematics was divided into geometry and arithmetic, and these were just considered to be clearly different subjects with different subject matters. And geometry was the much more developed and geometry was the branch of mathematics that for example, Newton used to write the Principia. Um, over the course of a couple hundred years, numbers and number theory and numerical representations in algebra have overtaken physics completely. Um, and there's a story to be told about how that happened and the different steps. And I've been trying to tell that story in, 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 in one book and I'm working on another book. Um, but, uh, and in a way, the, one of the signal moments in that history was Dedekind who was teaching, uh, teaching calculus and he considered calculus to be about numerical functions, properties of numerical functions. And he found when he was teaching, he kept having to appeal to geometrical intuitions and he didn't like that, right? He thought that was off topic, that you ought to be able to prove things about limits and so on without any appeal to geometry. So data can work very hard to get all the geometry out of his out of his calculus and out of his arithmetic. 
Um, and I think that's fine, but I wanna do the opposite thing. I wanna try and get all the arithmetic out of my geometry because I think geometry more directly uh, corresponds to the structure of the physical world. Um, chance, objective chance is a, is, is, is a, a sort of funny topic and I'm not gonna be going into the foundations of chance. I'm gonna be going into the representation of chance, which is a different topic. Um, and credence is yet something else altogether. And really this, the, insofar as this is, is about the representation of credence and then about rational credence. So there's a tremendous amount of, of stuff I need to cover, including practical decision-making and so on that I can't possibly get to that's in this paper. So what I did was I made up a, a, a PowerPoint for what I think is absolutely the basic point. And I'll go through that if that's all I have time to do, that's fine. If there's extra time and people want to talk about some other topics or more specific things, uh, instead of preparing something, I'll just take up whatever. Okay, so that's the preamble. Let me uh, now try and screen share this. Uh, on. Okay, so I take it everybody can see the slides now. Yeah, that's what yeah. Okay, so uh, let me just start. Obvious thing that when we talk in everyday life about chance, we almost always use numbers when we discuss it. Um, so you turn on the TV and you're told that there's a certain chance of rain tomorrow and that's quantified by saying something like a 45% chance of rain. Think of that as point, you know, point 0.45. This is so endemic to the way we think about chance that it's, it, it takes some effort to step back and consider whether that's necessary and also what it means, right? How do numbers get into this game? Um, and there are some pretty straightforward things to say about how numbers get into the game, but you, you really need to begin by going absolutely to the foundations and saying, well, rain, <laughs> rain itself has nothing obviously numerical about it. Um, chances of rain are even spookier kinds of things, right? Because you can look out the window and see that it's raining, but you can't just look out the window and tell what the chance of rain is. Or if, if, you know, if the weather person says that there's a 45% chance of rain, at the end of the day, it either rains or it doesn't. And there's nothing 45%-ish about that. Um, and then we have to talk about long-term statistics or things like that. But there, there is a gap, a uh, conceptual gap between chance and numbers that would need to be filled in. Okay. Um, and and as, an, as a, an illustration of this, I, I just want people to see that there is a gap between these two phrases. If I say there is no chance at all that something happens, no chance, uh, that sounds synonymous with there's zero chance, where zero is now a numerical object. And if I say something is absolutely certain to happen, it's going to happen. It's guaranteed to happen. Uh, that sounds offhand similar to saying it has a 100% chance, okay? Those are, however, different claims. Um, and sort of everybody who works with this stuff is actually gonna step in and say, no, 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 those really are not synonymous. <laughs> and, and, and so you need to start thinking about the relation between the numbers that are used and other locutions about chance. So formally what's going on, and again, uh, some of this will be familiar to lots of people, maybe it's not so familiar to some people. Um, in physics, what's usually invoked here when one talks about chances or probabilities are things that are called Kolmogorov probability functions. Um, and Kolmogorov came up 
in the 30s, I believe, with some axioms for these things, and he laid down the axioms. So there's a well-defined sense of what one means by a Kolmogorov probability function. Um, it's a function, so it maps something into something else, and in particular, it maps a set of propositions or a set of what are often called events into the numbers, the real numbers between zero and one. So for every proposition or every event, it assigns such a real number. And not just in any way at all. So that's the first thing about it. So you've got <clears throat> immediately, this is how numbers are gonna get into the game, right? Because Kolmogor if you use a Kolmogorov probability function, you're already invoking numbers as the, as the values of that function. Uh, and then there are some constraints on what that function can look like. So here's the main constraint. Um, if two events are mutually exclusive, so they can't both happen, then the number assigned to their disjunction is the sum of the numbers assigned to them, right? So if, if you can't have both A and B, and there's some number assigned to A, and there's some number assigned to B, then the number assigned to the proposition or event A or B is to be the sum. And that's just part of the definition of what a Kolmogorov probability function is. Um, that, because that, that's stated in terms of just a pair of events, and you can of course iterate that. So you can say, well, if there are a triple of events that are all mutually exclusive, then the probability assigned to the disjunction of all three has to be the sum of the three. And you can repeat for any finite number of events or finite number of propositions. Then it gets a little tricky uh, because, well, what about if you, if you want the disjunction of an infinite number of events? And then you have a choice. Sometimes you say, you have what's called sigma additivity, which says, well, if you've got this denumerable set of events, then you can kind of similarly add up, uh, which is going to mean now take a limit, add up all these numbers to get the number assigned to the event that's that infinite disjunction. Um, sometimes you don't demand that. One thing you never ever do is demand ar arbitrarily that take any set of events that the number assigned to the uh, disjunction, or that is the, the number assigned to the set is the sum of the numbers assigned to the individual elements. You never demand that because everything will go completely crazy and wrong um, for reasons that we'll see in a second. Okay, and that's, that's the most technical slide on this entire talk, okay? <laughs> So if you're worried, you know, that this is going to get deep into mathematics, no, you just sort of have to have a sense of what a Kolmogorov function is. Um, and, well, there's one more thing. It, you, can, it, you can take the disjunction of all the, all the events, the entire set of things that are considered to be possible events, that gets assigned the value one. Okay, so that's the top value. Um, you could also add that if you, if, you, if you throw in a kind of impossible event, like that it rains and doesn't rain, that will be assigned the value zero. Uh, so that will give you these bounds on the space of the, uh, 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 of the range of the function between zero and one. Okay, so that's what a Kolmogorov probability function is. It, it, I will just call them Kolmogorov functions, I think, because when you add probability into the name, you're kind of rather blatantly suggesting that this is the way to represent probability, uh, which is exactly the point I'm going to dispute. Okay. Um, now numbers between zero and one often are used, and this is not nearly as natural as in the case of chances where, where the saying there's a 50% chance or a 30% chance or whatever uh, just rolls off the tongue and that's the way we think about chances. There's something else where real numbers between zero and one have been recruited as representatives, which is, which is 
degrees of credence or degrees of belief. So how does that work? That's a little bit different. And uh, they really are gonna be running through this talk, these two parallel tracks of talking about credence and talking about chance. And they're very deeply related to each other. They're related by something that David Lewis called the principal principle. I'm not gonna worry so much about that. I just want you to notice that there are these two topics and sometimes I'll be talking about chances and sometimes about credence. Okay, so where do we start there? Well, we have, we, we, we have all different degrees of belief in different propositions. I mean, there's some claims that we believe in some decent sense more strongly or more firmly or more steadily or to a higher degree or something else than other claims. Uh, and sometimes it's quite obvious how that ranking of strength of belief goes. Um, well, there's a long tradition, not so long as for chance, but a reasonably long tradition of trying to quantify degrees of belief using Again, a Kolmogorov quote probability function, just call it a Kolmogorov function because it's no longer a probability. It's just a, a rather supposed to be a measure or a representation of degrees of credence, of degrees of belief. Okay, um, but, the, but the same constraints are put on that function. And then you ask, just as you, you really need to ask as soon as someone does this, well, wh you know, where do these numbers come from, right? What, if you say there's a 45% chance of rain, where does 45, you know, where does 0.45 come from? Um, if you say, I've got a 0.38 credence, degree of credence that it will rain, the first question is, well, where, where the heck did that number come from? Where, what for this 0.38? And, um, and the normal way this is done, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm giving an only slightly cartoonish version of this, is, this, is actually, again, if, if you start out, I mean, if we go back and we say the whole probability thing started when people had these games of chance, right? When they started playing cards and playing roulette and playing dice with, you know, playing dice with actual proper cubicle dice and not with, um, ox bones or whatever the hell they were throwing uh, and using cards and they could actually do calculations for the chances of winning the game under certain strategies. Um, so the idea of betting and the idea of odds was baked in, in the, you know, when, when, they started, when they started doing a proper theory of chance. And then this idea of betting and odds comes in to generally be used to get at degrees of belief. And so you say to someone, well, look, uh, you think it's gonna rain today? And you say, well, I think it might. And then you say, okay, but tell me something much more precise. Tell me what you think the fair odds are for a bet that it'll rain today. And by the fair odds, what one is supposed to mean is a bet that you'd be willing to take either side of, right? So you give odds like, well, okay, three to two. And if you want to bet that it will rain at those odds, I'll take the other side. And if you want to bet that it won't rain at those odds, I'll take the other side. I don't care. I think those are fair odds, right? And by forcing someone to be willing to take either side of the bet, you're, you're, you're supposed to rule out that they're just you know, monkeying with the odds or giving you bad odds or something, they're supposed to give you these fair odds. And, and those odds, which are, you know, can be stated in terms of some number to some number, like how much money do I have to bet, to place at risk in order to win how much money, that's supposed to be the route into assigning uh, these degrees of credence, numerical values. Good. Um, now, well, what about this idea? And this has been, I guess, pointed out many times, which is that what I just said is absolutely insane, okay? And, and again, a lot of this talk is just gonna be saying the normal thing and then stepping back and saying, that's absolutely crazy, right? You, you just, this, this, this is not a good place to begin. Um, 
the idea that people would be willing or should be willing or must be willing, and sometimes you put a gun to their head and force them into this, to offer fair odds in the sense I just mentioned on propositions is simply insane. So for example, uh, someone says, well, here's a proposition that Argentina will win the World Cup in 2022. And you ask me, what do I think about that? And I kind of shrug and say, I don't know, I guess it could happen. You know, I, I really know next to nothing about soccer, okay? Um, I certainly kind of regard that as a possibility. I, I, I certainly don't regard it as a certainty. And then someone says, no, 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 no. What are the fair odds that you would offer so that I could bet on either side for or against Argentina in this particular proposition? You, know, you understand the proposition, don't you? I said, yeah, I understand the proposition perfectly well. Well, what are your fair odds, right? And my answer is none. I, I will not bet with you on that proposition. Um, I will certainly not offer any odds that I'll take either side of for the simple reason, I mean, you know, I know nothing about this topic. I know what soccer is, right? Um, uh, I am really deeply ignorant about this and I would be an idiot to offer you odds that I would take either side of because you know most random people off the street would know more about it and I would probably lose a, pon a ton of money if I went around <laughs> as a bookie on that particular right topic so so the the straightforward answer to what are the odds I would offer is I wouldn't um, and then somebody puts a gun to my head and says if you don't give me some odds, I will shoot you in the head. And then I say, okay, I'll give you some odds, fine, right? Um, but but the, whatever number comes out of my mouth has pretty much nothing to do with anything except that I wanna save my own life. Um, furthermore, here's the thing about credences. Sometimes they're incomparable. Sometimes uh, not only do I not have odds I would offer, but sometimes if you ask me which of two propositions do I believe to a higher degree or more strongly, the answer is neither. Um, and not because I believe them to the same degree. Um, so here's another proposition that maybe, maybe you know, I, I assume most of you don't follow American football at all. I actually don't either. Um, that, that the New England Patriots will win the Super Bowl in 2022, okay? So my state of belief with respect to that is basically the same as that Argentina winning the World Cup. That is, it's something that could happen. Um, I know that the New England Patriots are a team and they play. Um, they have some chance of winning it. They're certainly not guaranteed to win it. Beyond that, I, I'm kind of clueless about it. Um, I would not offer any particular odds on that for exactly the same reason. But further, suppose you came to me and you said, look, here are two tickets. Here's a ticket that will give you this nice prize if the Patriots win the Super Bowl in 2022, and here's a ticket that will give you that nice prize if Argentina wins the World Cup, which do you prefer? Because this would now be a kind of behavioral test for which of those propositions do I uh, believe more strongly? And my answer would be, I don't care. I, I, don't, I don't have a preference between the two. I'm happy to flip a coin. Um, I, I, I don't have any sense of one being either more or less credible than the other, nor do I believe they're equally credible. And I'll get to that in a second. So that's how we get to incomparability between these things. Um, well, why, why is it that I wanna say that, that this shoulder shrugging, I don't care, I don't know, I don't have any opinion is not the same as saying, I believe them to be equally credible. Well, this is kind of obvious. Let's just add a third proposition. So now we're gonna have three. We have Argentina wins the World Cup in 2022. We have the Patriots win the Super Bowl in 2022. And we have that Argentina makes it to the finals of the World Cup in 2022. All right, so I've added the third one. Uh, and I say, I don't regard either of A and B as more credible than the other, nor do I regard them as equally credible. Why? Uh, well, first of all, the sim so this is a nice symbolization. This is some people already use this. This incomparability will use this little bow tie thing with the you know, less than sign and greater than sign back to back. So that just symbolizes this, I don't, you know, I don't have an opinion about the relative credibility of these. Um, 
or you know, my, my credences are not comparable in these two things. Um, for the same reason that I don't have any preference about Argentina winning the World Cup and the Patriots winning the Super Bowl, I have no preference between Argentina making it to the finals of the World Cup and the Patriots winning the Super Bowl, right? Again, I'm just profoundly ignorant on both topics. They have no logical or conceptual relation to each other at all. Uh, and so I, I given get, offering me a ticket between the, the one that pays if the Patriots win the Super Bowl and one that wins if Argentina makes it to the finals, I also would have no preference. I don't know. Okay. So that's the relate, that's certainly the relationship between the proposition about the Patriots and either of the propositions about Argentina. However, obviously, ineluctably, and you know, as a matter of pure rationality, C is more credible than A, right? It's much, it's I, I believe to a higher degree that Argentina will make it to the finals of the World Cup than that Argentina will win the World Cup. Um, and strictly higher degree, not greater than or equal to, I I actually do believe it's more credible. And there, if you, if you gave me a choice between two tickets that gave the same prize, one of which pays off if Argentina makes it to the finals and the other of which pays off if Argentina wins, of course I'm gonna take the one that, that pays off if they make it to the finals, right? I would be insane if I didn't do that. Um, any rational person would do that. On what basis? Right? And I'm, I'm making you know, these claims as strong as I can because I believe them that strongly. Right? You would be, there would be something wrong with you if you didn't say, I'll take the ticket that pays off if they make it to the finals over the ticket that pays off if they make it, if they win the thing. Well, why is that? Um, well, uh, all right, well, actually, let me go back. For the obvious reason that there are ways that I regard as possible for Argentina to get to the finals but not win. And there are no ways for it to win but not get to the finals. <laughs> okay. Uh, one thing that could happen, as far as I'm concerned, is that Argentina makes it to the finals and then loses in the finals. Uh, and therefore, it's more likely, it's strictly more likely that they make it to the finals than that they win. It's strictly more likely, uh, and that, that's sort of the talk of probability. You see how probability and cr credibility just, you trade off between them, you don't even notice. It's in some sense objectively more likely that they make it to the finals than that they win. It is more rationally credible that they make it to the finals that they win. Okay, so I have now these three relations. A and B have this in, in comparability relation. A, B, C and B have this in comparability relation. But C is strictly more credible than A. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that this incomparability relation is not the same as equality, because equality is transitive and reflexive. If it were equality, then from A incomparable B and B incomparable C, I would have to have you know, A incomparable C. But that's not right. A is not incomparable with C. A is strictly less credible than C. So that incomparability relation just isn't the same as equality. And my indifference, when you offer me a ticket on Argentina and you offer me a ticket on the Patriots, my indifference between them is not a reflection of a judgment that these are equally credible or equally plausible or equally possible or equally likely. They're not equally anything. They're, I just don't have an opinion uh, about their relative likelihood or their relative credibility. Um, and notice, now the second thing to notice is, is that I'm in a situation here where I have absolutely no idea what fair odds I mean, there are no fair odds I would assent to here, okay? That, that, that idea that I'm gonna quantify by fair odds, they don't exist. Nonetheless, even though I can't assign fair odds, and so I can't assign numbers, 
in the usual way. I am absolutely certain that one proposition is more credible than the other, right? C is more credible than A. And the way I come to that conclusion cannot have to do with comparing numbers because there are no numbers to compare. In fact, the whole thing goes the other way around, right? If you insist, which I'm arguing you shouldn't, but if you insist on using numbers, then the fact that C is strictly more credible than A tells you you better assign a higher number to C than you do to A. But it's not, you know, but, but now it's, you know, the, the order, what's the order of dependency here? The order of dependency is I already know for reasons that have nothing to do with numbers at all that C is more credible than A. Therefore, if you force me to represent this by numbers, I better use a bigger number. It's not the other way around. It's not like, oh yeah, I, I've got these numbers that are assigned to these propositions. Let me consult the numbers and see which is more credible. Um, and the reason for that is the one that I already mentioned. There are strictly more possible ways for Argentina to get to the finals than there are for Argentina to win. Because every way that Argentina wins, it first gets to the finals, but not every way it gets to the finals does it end up winning. Uh, and that's the reason why the one is more credible than the other. OK. Now, all of this, I hope, if you haven't studied probability or credence or thought a lot about it, uh, which is to say you have not been corrupted by philosophy here. All of this, I hope, strikes you as so obvious that no one could possibly deny it. Um, the fact is that almost every philosopher denies it, OK? <laughs> um, and I guess probably almost every physicist denies it. And so I, this is, uh, to me, really problematic. Um, so let, let's just. Can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Um, if, if you see how uh, the history of philosophy of the probability goes, uh, people see it as a great achievement for Definetti's proof that you can uh, look at uh, constraints on various bets that people can make uh, and then derive the, the mathematical structure of, of probability functions. So they, okay. they see it as, okay, um, if we go that route, if we sort of construct this uh, account of how you place bets, and you, of course, you're you're forced to place bets when, uh, in in practical circumstances, you can choose not to place a bet, and of course, you can, um, as you mentioned, you can sort of decide between two things whether they're comparably uh, probable or not, but they do see it as a kind of a success to actually see the structure of probability come out of, of, of viewing credence in this way. Mm -hmm. So um, isn't this a, a theoretical fact worth uh, just uh, considering as relevant when, when we are evaluating uh, credence in this way? So it's just a, an explanation of what probability is. If we take it as subjective evaluations of whether an event will definitely or not definitely happen. Um, and then we have this uh, scheme of um, explaining how to derive a mathematical account of those uh, level of confidences or, or credences, then why isn't that uh, an explanation or not? Why isn't that something that is an achievement uh, in itself in a philosophy of probability? Okay, so let me say, I mean, the way I would put it is this. The achievement is to start from a bad basis and derive a bad conclusion. So I don't, I'm, I'm not happy with that. The bad basis is requiring people to, to, to place these bets when they have no, no actual disposition to do so. Um, so it's not quite clear. I mean, and, and let me say one more time. Actually, the, the, there's this terminology which I'm trying to avoid of subjective probability. What you're calling subjective probability is what I'm calling credence, degree of belief, okay? Um, and I'm just trying to avoid the word probability there. 
Um, and then there's something else that's often called objective chance, right? So when someone says, look, um, you know, the chances of drawing an inside straight in poker are such and such, or the chances of the ball landing on a, on a red uh, number when you play roulette or such and such, that's not supposed to be a claim about anybody's beliefs about anything. That's supposed to be a claim about roulette balls um, and, and cards. Um, so those are supposed to be kind of objective chances. So first of all, it, it's not at all, I mean, inquiring into people's dispositions to bet is inquiring into their psychological state. I don't see how anything about objective chance can come out of that. You're, you're not sure. even in the I mean, ballpark. Um, but, but furthermore, the achievement is supposed to be that what you show is a representation theorem of the form that, yeah, uh, given that you that this and this and this and this, and you have Dutch book and blah, 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 then there must be these Kolmogorov functions together with utility functions that work together, together with the theory of practical rationality to represent all this. Um, now, since I think those Kolmogorov functions give you the wrong results, just objectively the wrong results, I don't think it's an achievement to, 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 to say from this basis, I derived this, right? It's actually by modus tollens, it's, it's actually already a proof that your basis was wrong. Okay, um, I'm just, uh, um, usually they, they just say, because we could do this derivation, because we could start from this basis, say, say uh, we have the uh, levels of belief that have a sort of a psychological uh, function for people, and then we can model this. So obviously the model is very much uh, an idealization and doesn't reflect how people actually think and how actually evaluate their confidence. I mean, the, the, the usual claim is that the, the very fact that we can derive the Kolmogorov functions from that suggests that there's something, it, it tells us something about, about credence in general, or, or it, it, it provides a good model of what credence is. But I, I... So you just have to fill in, I mean, I hope you see why I'm puzzled about what you're saying. First, you ask people to do something they don't wanna do. Like you say, okay, here's this proposition about Argentina, here's this proposition about the Patriots. Which one do you think is more credible? And their natural response is to say, I don't think either is more credible. That's my response. Then you say, no, no, you must choose. I hereby demand that thou choose. And, and you say, oh, you know, I don't know, flip a coin, I don't care. It's not my, you know, it's not my subjective, actual state of subjective belief that's reflected in this choice. If you force me to make it, I'll do it in some random way. And then having forced me to do that, you say, oh, I can represent your beliefs by these Kolmogorov functions. Well, first of all, you're not representing my beliefs because you're basing it on data uh, uh, I, I did this by purpose so that people will see you better. Oh, okay. Um, you're, you're, you're basing it on data that doesn't actually correspond to my actual psychological state. And furthermore, as we'll see, if you require to represent my psychological state by a Kolmogorov function, it's going to get it in other ways, not just wrong, but flatly irrational. Um, it, it will make me out to be an idiot which I'm not. Um, now, when I say that, the, of course, I need something to back it up. And what I have to back it up is the thing that was on the, 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 the next slide, this Euclidean principle. So that's why that's in the, the title to this talk. Um, this is a principle that unlike forcing people to make bets they don't want to make or whatever, this is a, a principle I, I claim, a foundational principle of rationality. Uh, if someone, if someone violates it, we are in our rights to say they're crazy. And it's also a foundational principle for objective chance. Um, and therefore, any attempt to theorize about or represent either, either rational credence or objective chance in a way that runs afoul of this principle has gone wrong. That's, that's you know, basically all that I'm going to argue today. And the way to convince you of that is to look at this Euclidean principle and see how ineluctable it is, how unavoidable, how completely rational. Um, and therefore, 
if you have a theory that tells you to accept my theory, you've got to deny this, then you should just jettison the theory. Okay, so I, you can... Yeah, this is not what people say. <laughs> this is the opposite of what people say. No. I, it, it's, uh, I'm not, I don't care that it's the opposite of what people say. I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, trying to bring out why people say it. So they, they, they say it because they seem, they seem convinced that there's some sort of an explanation of, as to where these common goal functions are coming from or how, mm -hmm. how we understand them philosophically. And if, right. if, if there is a story to be told about how we understand them philosophically, and if we use these numbers in a whole range of cases, then uh, it seems convincing to people. So that's all I'm saying. It's, it's okay. just... Yeah, I, the, the psychology of how, as, as usual in foundations, <laughs> the psychology of how people got into the particular little cul-de-sacs they get into is interesting, but it's not my, I mean, the first thing I have to do is convince you they've gotten themselves into a cul-de-sac. Um, they're not where they should be. And if, if I can convince you of that, the further historical psychological question of how they managed to convince themselves of this is an interesting one, but you know, you can't even raise it without first establishing that they've just made a mistake, which is what I'm going to try to do today. Okay. So we'll, we'll hear that. So we're very uh, now uh, intrigued to listen to the, uh, to, to the end of the talk. <laughs> Good. So can I, can you, can you yes. return me my- uh, you, you, you return it to yourself. Just oh, I do it? Okay. Oh. Okay, so what's the Euclidean principle? And this is, again, for anybody who's never heard of this, two months ago, three months ago, I never heard of it. I didn't know any of this stuff. Um, this just turns out to be the key to the whole thing. Um, so the Euclidean principle, the reason why it's called the Euclidean principle, just states that the whole is greater than the, than the proper part. Um, that's not the way you will get into Euclid himself. He didn't use the word proper part because this idea of calling a, a thing, an entire thing, a part of itself is just, it's a weird thing to say, right? And the Greeks were not that strange. So he just said the whole is greater than the part. Well, how does that help us out here? Uh, so this is actually axiom five. I'll put up the rest of the axioms later. This is axiom five in Euclid's elements. Um, so there are possible ways for Argentina to win the World Cup in 2022. And those possible ways are a proper part of the ways for it to reach the finals in 2022, right? Because every way it wins the cup, he gets there by going through the finals. Um, and therefore, and now here's the principle, um, it's more likely and this, so that's objective chance talk and more credible, that's rational belief talk that it'll reach the finals, then, it'll, then that it will win because the whole is greater than the proper part. Done, that's it. That principle I claim is manifestly true. It's undeniable. And if you come up with a theory of chance or you come up with a theory of rational credence that denies it, you've made a mistake somewhere, okay? Uh, and this turns out to be pretty powerful. This actually turns out to have a lot of interesting applications. Um, and furthermore, in terms of explanatory power, it explains all kinds of intuitions we have. Like if somebody, you know, handed you, offered you these two tickets and said, here, this one wins if they, if they win the, the World Cup and this one wins if they get to the finals, you would grab the one that wins if they get to the finals. Everybody would, right? You would really not understand, literally not understand somebody who said, I don't care, or, you know, it's all the same to me between those two tickets. Um, you would think they were insane. Or, or else they, met, you know, it, it, the only other possibility is they have some belief that it is literally impossible for either one to happen or literally absolutely guaranteed they're going to get to the, they're going to win the thing, right? Um, that there's no chance. I mean, it's, you know, no chance they will win, get, win either or no chance that they won't vote, you know, there's no chance that uh, both tickets will not win and no chance that they that they will both win. Um, 
So let's add one more proposition to, to our set of three. Um, and again, just in case people don't know much about American football, American football is divided into two conferences, the American and the national conferences. Uh, Patriots happen to be in the American football conference. And now it's very similar. Um, in order to get to the Super Bowl, they have to win their conference. So let proposition D be the Patriots will win the American football conference in 2022 then what do we have? We have these, we have four propositions. We have six pairs of distinct propositions. And we have these relations of credibility for me between them that uh, none of the propositions about soccer are comparable, right? They're all incomparable to any of the propositions about football. And in the case of soccer, it's more credible that they get to the Argentina get to the finals and that they win. And in football, it's more credible that the Patriots win their conference and that they win the Super Bowl. And in terms of relations, relative credences, relative degrees of belief, that's all there is to say. Um, if all you have to work with are these four propositions. Now, the problem is if you say, well, what I really want to do is assign numbers to these four propositions, such that, for example, if one proposition is more credible than another, then I assign it a higher number. Uh, and if they're exactly equally credible, I assign them the same number. Um, then I can't do it. There's just no way to use numbers for that purpose. Because why? Because for any pair of real numbers, the only possibilities is that one is greater than the other or they're exactly equal. There is no incomparability relation between real numbers. Um, and therefore, I claim, the idea of representing degrees of belief or strength of conviction by assigning numbers to propositions and then reading their relative credibility off the relations between the numbers is just a non-starter. It's not going to work. Um, at least in this most naive way of representing degrees of belief by uh, Kolmogorov functions. Um, now, immediately when, when this is pointed out, <clears throat> the first response is to, is to move to something fancier than these Kolmogorov functions, right? So remember the Kolmogorov functions assign real numbers between zero and one inclusive <clears throat> to each event or each proposition. And then people say, well, maybe what I should do is not assign individual numbers, but intervals. Okay, so suppose, you know, to, to one proposition, I assign not a single number, but an interval. <clears throat> and then I say, well, I'd be willing to give a bet at odds above this or take a bet at odds below this. And in between, I just won't bet. And then if I have two intervals that kind of sort of overlap, like this or whatever, you know, that the intervals can now be related in funny ways. One interval can be greater than another, or they could be exactly the same, or they can kind of just partially overlap. And then you say, oh, this incomparability thing, <clears throat> that's an overlap. So this is the first kind of tweak to the approach that occurs to people. But what I want to do, again, the, the main thing is step back and just ask this more basic question, which is, why are you doing this? <clears throat> why are you insisting on finding some numerical representation of this? Why are you working so hard? And we'll see, people go to more and more complicated and obscure arithmetical structures to try and do this. Because when they do the simple thing, it doesn't work for reasons that I just gave. And then you say, okay, I'll do a fancier thing and a fancier thing and a fancier thing than that. And we'll look at two different directions you can fancy this up. But I don't really want to get into the game of I point out a problem and then somebody goes fancier and does something even more complicated, right? And then it's like, this is never going to end. Because at some point you have to step back and ask, why are we doing this, right? What's the point? What's the motivation? It can't be that, that these numerical things, as it were, directly correspond to anything going on in my head. 
It can't be. That's not what's going on. So why are we doing it? Okay. So let me talk about creedal states. Again, now this is to switch over. I'll come back to objective chances where some of what I'm going to say becomes much more controversial, <laughs> amazingly. Um, but let's start with creedal states. Uh, so suppose that is a state of belief. Suppose you want a representation, an abstract representation of my creedal state regarding those four propositions. Well, okay, I've already given you one. It's that. That tells you for every pair of propositions out of that set of four, how they're related with respect to their relative credibility. Uh, in four cases, their credibilities are incomparable, and in two cases, they're comparable. Um, and I claim that's it. That is my creedal state. If, if you only had, if the only beliefs you had, now this isn't really possible, but if the only beliefs you had were in those four propositions, that's all you could say. That would be a complete representation of your creedal state. Um, and the point is, okay, I've just represented your creedal state. There are no numbers there. Um, I didn't mention any numbers. I didn't use any numbers. I didn't use any functions. There's no, it's just representing relations of relative credibility between propositions. And if you want an abstract mathematical representation and abstract mathematical representations are convenient things to have, then the right one to use is a graph. It's not, a, it's not any kind of function into the reals or it functions into any numbers, doesn't involve numbers. There's the graph. Okay, so you'll notice on the graph, I have the four letters that represent the four propositions. Uh, for every pair of propositions, I've drawn a line. The lines with these little squarish ends correspond to incomparability. And so I've put the little incomparability sign there. The, the, the arrows, the one, sided arrow is the strictly greater than relation. And I've put that there. You could have propositions that literally are exactly equal in credibility. That's not the same as being incomparable. And then you could put a two-headed arrow and put an equal sign. And if I have specified those relations for every pair of propositions, I claim that is the creedal state. That's all there is to it. Um, now, that's the story I claim about what's often called subjective probability. What about objective chance? What about, and, and this, again, I'm not sure if I'll have time to go into it. Um, at the end, if people are interested, I will. What about objective chances? All right, so you might say, look, uh, yeah, if you really want a psychologically realistic representation of people's states of belief, it's maybe not surprising that you would end up with incomparabilities because people's beliefs are kind of fuzzy and hazy and not exactly nailed down and so on. And that fuzziness or haziness could lead to these incomparabilities. So maybe this incomparability relation doesn't surprise you too much for credences. Um, but that's not normally the way we think about objective chances, objective probabilities, the chance that a, a fair coin comes heads when fairly flipped or a particular radiatum, radium atom decay in the course of a particular minute, right? That's the kind of thing you might say, no, no, no. There's a number there. Um, and in fact, for a fair coin, the number is 50%, right? That's what it means to be a fair coin fairly flipped. There's an equal chance First of all, that there's an equal chance that it comes heads and tails. That's really the definition of a fair coin. And then given the normal way you represent that with numbers, that means the number has to be 0.5. Um, and in the case of the decaying radium atom, you say, yeah, there's a, there's a real objective chance. And that's what determines the half-life of radium. And that's the kind of thing that physicists go into labs and put a lot of effort in trying to nail down. So there are, you know, there ought to be numbers there. I'm going to argue that's actually not true. Um, but you might at least 
have the thought that maybe I should give up on using numbers to represent credences, but uh, I should still stick to using these Kolmogorov functions to represent chances, objective chances. Now, it turns out there are some standard problems. Again, I didn't invent these or discover them. They're just absolutely standard problems. It's just, I think people don't take them on board. Um, and I'm gonna begin, this is, and this is standardly done. Now you could complain about it and I would actually listen to the complaints. There might be reasonable complaints, but let me just do what's standardly done. So you say, look, suppose a dart is randomly thrown at a dartboard in such a way that every point on the board has the same chance of being hit, right? It's, it's like the fair coin that all the points are equally likely. It's not more likely to end up on the right side or the left side or the top or the bottom or anything else. Uh, or sometimes people will say, suppose there's a way of randomly choosing a real number between zero and one so that every real number has the same chance to be chosen. And you say, well, that's like, um, flipping an infinite number of fair coins and then using those to give a decimal expansion in binary of, you know, of a real number. And every decimal expansion is just as likely as every other one because all the coins were fair, something like that. Um, so by stipulation of the case, and this is where you might say, I don't want to stipulate that because I don't think that's even possible. But by stipulation of the case, we say there are these various possible outcomes and they're all equally likely, right? Every point on the dartboard is equally likely to be hit. Every number between zero and one is equally likely to be chosen. Well, okay, what is that chance? If I have to quantify the chance or represent the chance by a, by a Kolmogorov function, what's the chance? Uh, well, here, Kolmogorov just fails again. Why? Um, suppose I want to represent these chances by a Kolmogorov function that goes from these various propositions into the reals. There are no acceptable choices for the value of that function. And it's just a dilemma. So let's let P and Q be two points on the dartboard. If we assign any positive real number, right, any positive real number to the proposition that P is hit, then since by stipulation all the points have the same chance of being hit, we have to assign that same positive real number to the proposition that Q is hit or that R or and so on for all the points there are. They're actually, we're imagining non-denumerably many points. Uh, it actually doesn't matter they're non-denumerably, they could be denumerably many points. I, okay. Um, infinitely many points, right? So just by stipulation, the chances are the same. If I were to assign any positive, suppose I had tried some positive real number. Um, now I'm messed up because by its definition, the Kolmogorov function, remember all of these propositions that it hits the particular point P, the particular point Q, the particular point R, they're all mutually exclusive, right? The dart's gonna hit one point. It can't hit more than one. And we said that for a Kolmogorov function, if we have these two events and they're mutually exclusive, then the number assigned to their disjunction has to be the sum of the numbers assigned to them, okay? Uh, and, but now I have an infinite number of these mutually exclusive propositions, all of which are equally likely and all of which have to be assigned the same number. Um, well, if you assign a positive real number to P, to the proposition that it'll hit P, then you have to assign the same positive real number to every point. But no matter how small a number it is you choose, there'll be some finite set of points S such that the chance of hitting a point in S becomes greater than one. Because every time I add a point to the set, I have to add that positive real number to the chance. And no matter how small a chance I choose, eventually by adding that chance to, a, you know, to the pile enough times, enough finitely many times, enough times, I'll eventually exceed one but I can't. 
Almogoro functions can't exceed one. Okay, so that makes no sense. I can't do that. I cannot assign a positive real number to represent that chance. That feature, by the way, just again, there's like a, a, you know some little bits of terminology here that are useful. Maybe everybody knew, knows this. That feature of the reals, which is that uh, any real number, any positive real number, no matter how small, if you add it to itself enough times, you'll eventually exceed any real number, no matter how big. That's called the Archimedean property. And Archimedes, Archimedes used that in defining ratios. It's an important property, important property that the reals have. Um, and it just, and the reals just have it, right? And because the reals have it, you cannot assign any positive real number as the chance to represent the chance. Okay. So that's one horn of our dilemma. Well, there's another horn. Team, team. The only other possibility, and this is the one everybody who does this uses, they, they're, they're forced into it, is to assign zero as the chance that any particular, uh, that the dart hits P, right? Or that the dart hits Q or the dart hits R. For any particular point, you say, ah, the value of the Kolmogorov function for that event is zero. And, uh, and as soon as they say that, they say, but remember, probability zero doesn't mean impossibility, right? Th those are different things. Something, can, something with probability zero can still happen. That better be because the dart's going to hit somewhere, right? <laughs> I mean, that's going to happen. So some, if every point gets probability zero and you throw the dart, some probability zero event will actually occur. And so this is, you know, people immediately say that. I said early on, uh, when you start using numbers, you don't even hear much of a difference between saying such and such is impossible and such and such has zero chance. But when you try and do this, you have to insist there's a difference between those two phrases. You're forced it, into, yeah. For the sake of time, we should, uh, Speed you, up. Yeah, yeah, okay. Because there are some right. people also want to ask questions. So if you could uh, make okay. conclusions, Good. then we'll open the that, that, I, I think actually I'm going to be okay. Um, okay. So I have to assign zero. But if I assign zero, then I run afoul of the Euclidean principle. Why? The, I, I, there's the, the chance that the dart will hit either P or Q, the disjunction. That chance is strictly greater than the chance that it hits P. This is the Euclidean principle. There are two ways for that to happen, only one way for the one to happen, and one's a subset of the other. Uh, but if we assign zero to P and zero to Q, we have to assign zero to P or Q and make them equally likely, but that's wrong. That's just wrong. They're not equally likely. One's strictly more probable than the other. And uh, there's a a, an additional problem, which is that these you often use conditional probabilities, which is the chance of something happening given that something else is granted, right? So the conditional probability of u given v, and those are usually calculated by division. Here's the actual, if you think of this chance function as a Kolmogorov function, the chance of u given v is just the chance of u and v divided by the chance of v. But if the chance of v is zero, then that's not well-defined because you can't divide by zero. So those conditional probabilities are not well-defined, uh, but we think they are. In this case, what is the chance that P is hit given conditional on the claim that either P or Q is hit? Well, then you should say, uh, then you would normally say that's 50%. If either P or Q is hit, the chance that it was P is 50% because they were equally likely and one of the two happened. Um, but on the standard view, that's not well defined. Okay, now what do I do about this? Well, now the standard thing, instead of going to intervals, I now go to new number fields. So, so Kolmogorov functions are into the reals. And now people say, ah, oh, what we need to do is have these functions go not into the real numbers, but into a different number field that is not Archimedean. Doesn't have the Archimedean property. And there are these things, I'm not gonna even try to explain what they are. The surreal numbers, the hyper real numbers. Sometimes this is called the theory of infinitesimals. And then these no longer have the Archimedean property. And then you say, well, but I don't want to actually assign exact surreal numbers, so I'm going to assign intervals of surreal numbers. And now this is just 
you know, this is the talk. This is the talk. Stop it. <laughs> you know, wake up. Stop. <laughs> okay, it's just getting worse and worse. Um, um, why do you want to use numbers? You're, you're just getting into trouble. You try and use real numbers, they don't work. You try and use exact numerical values, they don't work. Uh, you don't need numbers, okay? There was no reason in the beginning to think that, the, that there were numbers floating around here. Um, numbers do not provide a good, adequate means of representation that's well suited to represent what you want to represent, which is the structure of credence and the structure of chance. And you say, well, well, how do I represent it? Okay, I already gave you a way, use a graph. Use a graph and use these relations of relative credence or relations of relative probability, right? Sometimes you can say one thing is more probable than another. Sometimes you can say they're strictly equally probable. Sometimes you can say their probabilities are not even comparable, but I, I didn't put that here. If people wanna go into that, I can go into that. But you use a graph, you have these propositions, you have these relations between them, you can represent that using a graph. And the four relations on the graph are the ones we've talked about, equality, right? And this is gonna be equally true for credence and for chance. Credence, you can have exactly the same degree of credence in two propositions. You can have exactly the same objective chance. Uh, one can be more credible or likely than the other or the other way around, less likely, or they can be incomparable. And for every pair, specify one of those. And you've now specified a complete creedal state and you've specified a, com a complete uh, account of the chances. So. I wanna say that's all a creedal state is, that's how to represent it, that's all objective chance is, that's how to represent it. Um, and so in the case of our darts, what do we have? By stipulation, the chance that P is hit is equal to the chance that Q is hit. That's because that's the way I set up the problem. Uh, and since either P or Q might be hit by the Euclidean principle, we have that the chance that either P or Q is hit is strictly greater than the chance that P is hit. Okay, but that's just between those two, that's gotta be the relation of, of objective chance. Uh, and we can even extend that. We take any set of points, any two sets of points on the dartboard S and S prime. If S is a proper subset of S prime, then by the Euclidean principle, the chance that some point in S prime is hit is strictly greater than the chance at some point. Oh, there's two primes there, that's a mistake. Okay, that S is hit. That second one should just be S, right? The, the, the chance that it hits in the sub, proper subset is strictly less than the chance that it hits in the superset because it could hit in the superset and not in the subset. That's just the Euclidean principle. And that any acceptable account of objective chance has to have that consequence and no assignment of real numbers to the propositions can give you that. So stop trying to use real numbers. Um, now, I'm, I, I did speed up a lot and I'm actually gonna come now to the end pretty quickly. Why would one wanna use numbers? Well, because numbers, you have some operations that are defined on them. You have addition, subtraction and, and ratio relations between numbers. And those are convenient. They're nice to use, they're nice to refer to, but you can have those very relations, those very operations defined on things that are not numbers. Um, so the part of the appeal of using numbers to represent magnitudes, I think there's a main one, is that you have these algebraic operations. Uh, and among the operations are addition, subtraction, in many cases, division. We saw division used a minute ago in defining conditional probabilities. But there are operations that are, can properly be called addition and subtraction and relations that can properly be called ratios. So I'm not gonna use the word division, ratios, that are not operations on number fields. They're just not defined over number fields. They're defined over something else. So Euclid, we go all the way back to the elements. He starts with five axioms and five postulates. The postulates are called postulates because they're about geometry and they only have application to geometry, but they're also the axioms. And the axioms are wider than the postulates because they have application also outside of geometry. And in particular, they have application in arithmetic. And so um, here are the five axioms. Things that are equal to the same thing are equal to one another. So that's the transitivity of equality. 
If equals be added to equals, the holes are equal. Notice the reference to addition there. Equals added to equals are equal. Equals subtracted from equals are equals. Note that to a subtraction there. Uh, things which coincide, there's a congruence. Don't worry about that. And then the last one I already mentioned, the whole is greater than the part. So Euclid says, these are general principles. They apply throughout mathematics. They apply to geometry, which is where he's going to use them. They also apply to arithmetic, OK? where you, you use the very same principles. Um, now, think of the one e equals added to equals are equal. Well, we know what it is to add numbers. And the Greeks thought of numbers just as the integers, the positive integers. We all know how to add those. But again, Euclid's doing geometry. We know how to add line segments. So suppose I give you two line segments, A and B, then, and, and I have a ruler, uh, I have a straight edge and a compass, I extend A and I construct a congruent copy of B that goes out from the end of A and that counts as adding A and B. And similarly subtracting, you just go the other direction. You sort of you know, have A and then you put B here and then the difference is that. So there's addition and subtraction of line segments and it obeys the same axioms. Equals added to equals are equal, equals subtracted from equals are equal. No numbers are involved, okay? So this is addition and subtraction with no numbers. Uh, we can add credences and chances and not mention any numbers. We do it by appeal to disjunction. So if A and B are mutually exclusive propositions, that is we regard A and B as an impossibility or A and B is an impossibility, so they're mutually exclusive, then we can say, we can add their credences or add their chances. We can say we have the sum. That's just the credence or chance in the disjunction, A or B. Um, if we call the chance of an impossible event bottom, which is better than zero because we're not using numbers, but it's bottom because it's the bottom of this graph that shows relative degrees of credibility or relative chance. Uh, then we can, we can put it this way. If the chance of A and B is bottom or the credence of A and B is bottom, then we have this addition operation. The chance of A plus the chance of B is the chance of A or B, or the credence in A plus the credence of B is the credence in A or B. Now, this does not define addition for any random pair of propositions because you need mutually exclusive propositions. But if you have mutually exclusive propositions, this is a perfectly fine definition of addition, you can uh, define subtraction in a similar way. You can also define ratios. And uh, I won't, you know, there's a long story about this, but I'll just say the main thing about ratios, and this is book five of Euclid, is that there is a relation of proportionality of ratios. So you say A, the ratio of A to B is the same as the ratio of C to D. And that's represented with these colons. And so we can say in the case of the chance that the point P is hit and the chance that either P or Q is hit, we can actually state using ratios of numbers, although they didn't have to be numbers, that those, those chances stand in the ratio of one to two. Okay, that is, it's, it's, so you can say properly, it's twice as likely that either P or Q is hit than that P is hit. It's twice as likely that either P or Q is hit than Q is hit. We can say all that, again, without really invoking numbers. Um, now, not every pair of propositions need to have a well-defined ratio. And given the way you construct them, you can see some won't. Um, for example, let P Tim, be some Tim, point. Tim, I, I really want to give some time for discussion. So if you yeah. could just wrap up. Yeah, uh, I'm really, really done. I'm not, I'm not kidding this time, <laughs> OK? Um, you can compare the probability that you hit P to the, to the probability that you hit on the right side of the dartboard. The probability you hit on the right side is larger by the Euclidean principle, but there's no ratio defined between the two. Okay, so basically you have similar resources. If you can define addition, subtraction, and ratios, you can then rewrite what's normally done in numbers in terms of these ratios. What I have here is Bayes' theorem which is, I'm, I'm doing this very quickly, but you'll see at the bottom, that's Bayes' theorem rewritten as a, as a as proportionality of ratios. And so there is no loss in giving up your numbers entirely, 
okay? You have Bayes' theorem, you, have a, you can have a complete theory of chances, you can have a complete theory of rational credences, you can have abstract representations without any numbers at all. And so by abandoning the numbers, okay, we lose nothing and we gain something precious and essential, which is the Euclidean principle. And that is my last, that actually is my last. Right. So that was uh, why this is called how to, ha how to, how to have uh, chances and credences without numbers, but with the Euclidean principle. I am done. Thank you very much. It was uh, very instructive and very rich. And there are, we have, I'm sure there are many questions, but there are a few that already reached me for people and asking. So I'll give Ori the first and there are a few others. Please, uh, You can ask if someone wants, perhaps we'll have more time. So please. Uh, Uh, Oi, we don't hear you. I prepared this uh, little sketch. I don't know if you can see it. Um, yeah. So I, I'm going to ask the question. I, I'll try to ask it very briefly. Okay, so you have the principle of indifference, usually in probability, which tells you that if you have uh, a bunch of various outcomes to a particular event and they're all equally probable then they have the same chance, right? So uh, on the left hand, we have, say we-, we throw That sounds a, analytic. Sorry? Doesn't, doesn't equal probable just mean have the same chance? Yes, but it's, it's a setup. The important thing is that the, it's a, some event that has various possible outcomes that are all equally likely, mm -hmm. right? So, so okay. it's a, usually the principle of indifference says, say you throw a dice, it has six sides, all of them are equal. Uh, equally probable. And so um, we have to get numbers there, right? Because if we can count the number of possibilities of the outcomes, and then uh, we say that they're all exclusive events, um, say in this case, we have six uh, outcomes that are possible and they're all equally probable. And so we can put a number on this, one over six. Um, now we go to the Dart case and uh, say we look at the right hand, uh, the right hand uh, uh, image, then we ask uh, what's the likelihood of the dart hitting the line crossing the target from left to right. And so if it's, a, if it's just a line of uh, infinitesimal length, it doesn't have any width. Um, we can't really represent it with, with a probability function, which is where you come in with your issues of how, why, why we have trouble with, with numbers. Because you say, um, if, if we divide the plane of the target into lines, and then we say, um, what's the, we use this, this principle of indifference and say, what's the probability of the dart hitting one of these lines, then the probability is zero because there are infinite number of lines dividing the plane. And so it, it's a problem with how to introduce a number to, to represent this probability uh, function, right? Um, if, if you give it the number, the, the probability zero, then when you add up all the probabilities, then you get zero and if you add if you, if you place a finite number, then if you add them up, it's greater than one and that's irrational. It doesn't make sense. So you have a problem, right? You can't apply the principle of indifference to continuous cases or cases where you have a uh, denumerable or non-denumerable cardinality in the set. But we obviously have tricks, right? We have um, various uh, ways to sidestep this issue by inventing these functions that um, you sort of say that the function's integral is one, and then the function is sort of spread out all over the, the continuous variable. And we do this all the time. So it's, it's obviously a trick, it's a, it's a cheat because the probability is not really defined at a particular, on a particular line or at a particular point, but we can define a continuous function um, which uh, we integrate of it and it's one and we can sort of find the probability of uh, where the dart will hit uh, in any given segment. So 
So my question is, uh, what's wrong? First of all, my question is, what's wrong with the cheat? And uh, the second question, if the cheat is okay, then it's, a, it's actually a refutation of the Euclidean principle, right? Because um, both the probability of hitting a, a line in the middle of infinitely, infinitesimally small width and hitting a point will be, uh, I, will, I will not be able to represent this with this, uh, with this function uh, with any kind of uh, finite number. So if we accept the cheat and we normally do, and this is what we do in, uh, in, in various cases, then the Euclidean principle is not acceptable. It's not, it's not right. Um, because obviously uh, if, if we can't assign any finite number to the point and to the line, then obviously the, it's, it's not more credible for the dart to hit the line than it is to hit the point. Um, and, and, and so maybe another question to ask is maybe, the, maybe the, the, the right lesson to take from this is that we just, just don't add uh, chances in this way. We just don't add them up. We don't say that the chance of, of, a line, of the dart hitting a line is greater in some sense than the chance of the dart hitting a point. So that's the question. Okay, so let me, let me make a couple comments. Um, the first one, which I kind of tried to get in early, is that there, there was a thing called the principle of indifference that was appealed to early in the discussion of probability. But that principle is not merely false, it's actually self-contradictory and incoherent. Um, that principle was supposed to say, um, <clears throat> if we have various events, possible events, and you have no information about them, then you should treat them as equiprobable. Okay, you should be indifferent between them. You should regard them as, meaning you should regard them as equally likely. That's just incoherent. Um, and it's shown incoherent in many ways by various paradoxes. And, you know, th this is kind of well understood. That was an actual principle. That wasn't a principle that was supposed to take you from ignorance to assessments of probability, <laughs> okay? So it would actually be a, a, a principle that did some work. It just turns out to be, to, to be an unworkable principle. Um, what you suggested was not a principle at all. You just said you should treat equal probability, equal probable events as equally likely, but that's all equal probable means. I mean, you're building in analytically, if you tell me um, such and such events are equally likely, then it, it's not that I'm getting their equal probability by the appeal to any principle. I'm getting it from your stipulation that I'm thinking of a case where these are equally probable. So there was actually no appeal to the principle of indifference there and the principle of indifference in any way everybody knows doesn't work. Um, the, the next question is, well, suppose I try and use these probability functions, these Kolmogorov functions, and I violate by what you call a cheat, and I end up violating the Euclidean principle. What should I conclude from that? Now, my conclusion is simple, don't cheat, right? I mean, it ought to be, you know, there are 10 thou shalt nots. Um, I don't know if exactly thou shalt not cheat is on the list, but you know, it ought to be. Um, cheating gets you into trouble, right? Um, you know, and the trouble you got into was that you found you had to deny the Euclidean principle, but it's evident that the chance that the, that the dart hits a particular point on your diagonal is less than the chance that it hit somewhere on the diagonal because there's a chance that it hit on the diagonal but not on that particular point. Um, to, to, y y again, there's a kind of weird, I mean, I guess it's what Popper used to call a conventionalist stratagem. If you absolutely wedge yourself um, to, to, to something, then no considerations will move you because you'll just reject, um, you'll reject all those considerations because to accept them, you'd have to give, give up, right? This is the sort of Trumpian theory of how to deal with elections. Um, it, but, you know, the, 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 all I can say is it's obviously the case that, that 
the chance of it hitting on the diagonal is greater than the chance of it hitting on a particular point on the diagonal. And if you introduce something you call a cheat that forces you to deny that, that's just proof that your cheat was cheating and it's not working and it's giving you bad results and you shouldn't do that. Um, now, I, I understand that this is a deeply entrenched method, right? This is what people are used to and it's what they learn in classes and it's what everybody does. But the considerations that show that it's untenable are not, it seems to me very complicated. And, and, and the availability of an option which doesn't require you to cheat is also, I just laid it out, you know, I, I mean, a bit more in the paper, but you can pretty well lay out an option that will give you all the formal tools that you're used to and allow you to use them with certain caveats about where you should trust them and where you shouldn't. And basically, if you're using Kolmogorov functions, where you should not trust them is where they give you the answer zero or where they give you the answer that uh, two probabilities are the same, which is just to say their difference is zero. Zeros you shouldn't pay any attention to. If the Kolmogorov function tells you that one probability is strictly greater than another, fine, go with that. Um, you can use that and that'll help you with the dartboard using the normal uh, area measures, which are the ones you're talking about, the, the flat probability distributions you can integrate over. Where that function is larger for one subset than for another, sure, then you should say it's more likely that it lands in the larger subset than in the other. But where those functions are the same, you should not say they're equally likely because that'll get you into trouble. So basically, the the fix to that is to say ignore the zeros. Okay. Generally, usually we stop at uh, this time, but since we have quite a few questions and we got a special distinguished guest coming through the elect with the electron from New York, we'll have some more time. So I understand those people who need to leave, and those who are interested can stay with us. Uh, so Menachem, please. Hi, Tim. Thank you very, very much for that talk. And I, I absolutely agree with two of your major claims and have to think more about the third. The two claims I agree with is driving a wedge, uh, a strong wedge between uh, probability and credence. Uh, the other big claim I agree with is that credence cannot be numerical. Um, whether probability does have numerical applications, I'll, the, the jury, as far as I'm concerned, is still out on that. Yeah. Now, my question is that there's one philosopher who devoted, uh, uh, um, who, who, de who, who devate, devoted his career to those two points, and that is L. Jonathan Cohen, L. J. Cohen. Um, starting in the 70s with implications of induction and working, I, th I think he's got three or four books. Um, and, and the sort of high point of his work is, is a detailed mathematical proof that the adequacy conditions for what he calls inductive support and you call credence are immappable in principle on the Kolgomorov axiom set. Mm -hmm. um, but, but what I want to push you on is, is to talk about credence, not in terms of articulating a gut feeling about how Argentina will do uh, um, <laughs> two years hence, but, but rather in, in articulating from a philosophy of science point of view, the degree of support, the de degree of credence we, we'd attribute to a hypothesis in view of test results or in, or, or in court. And, and he, he loves to put these both on the table at the same time in the view of uh, expert testimony. And, and there he claims that, that, that inductive support is a ranking, an incomparable between uh, different hypotheses with different, you know, relevant variables to test them by and it's like it, it's like a league okay so so you you, you can't give a, a, a numerical um uh, uh uh weight uh to you know to to weighing the the, the first second third and fourth um uh, teams in a league but you can say that the, so it and and he articulates this in terms of a very detailed 
version, S5 version of the Lewis Barkan logic. And, and I think he goes a long way beyond you. In, it, it's not just a graph representation mm -hmm. of credence. It's, it's, it's a real calculus, which is not numerical. Um, I, I think his work is, is really, really relevant to what you're doing. And I'd love to read your, 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 your full paper to see you know, where you're going with this beyond the, 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 um, uh, the basics you showed us today. So thank you very, very much. Well, th thanks for the comment. I mean, it, as I said at the beginning, and I was, it was not false modesty, I do not know this area well. Um, uh, one thing that's relevant or sort of similar to some of what I'm doing turns out to be something Popper suggested, these things called Popper functions, which were supposed to be ways also to deal with these infinitesimals. Um, that, that Hartree introduced me to. And I think Hartree actually mentioned the same books that you're mentioning. And I'm just unfamiliar with them. Um, I, I should say what I'm trying to do here and what I do in the paper is extremely modest um, um, in the sense that, yes, we need a full theory of inductive support. Um, the real guts of that are going to be substantive principles of how you make these comparisons. All I've been arguing is that the right way to represent the output of those principles should not be by numerical functions. So you're, you're gonna cripple yourself, right? You're gonna hobble yourself if you think that's what you're aiming at. Uh, the general problem of inductive support is you know, the hardest thing there is. <laughs> um, I probably not in the papers I have written, there are probably a few remarks I could make about using statistical methods to test, um, but, but I, I, I make no representation at all that I have said anything or will soon say anything deeply you know, illuminating about the really hard problem that you just mentioned. Thank you, David. No. Thank you. Thank you for this talk. I should say I'm way out of my areas here. But um, having said that, I'm not that worried about cheating, and I'm not that worried about counterexamples either, because these are models, so we know we're cheating. And the question is whether they're useful, and they can be used theoretically useful, and, and they can be theoretically useful in some contexts and not in others. So merely showing a problem in some con in one context. Um, does not convince me that we shouldn't use the model in other contexts. So really the question for me is, and this is also a question you came to in the later parts of the talk, how much, if anything, is lost if we don't use numbers? How useful is your alternative, right? So, so in this spirit, I want to ask about incomparability. Um, and su suppose we ask, who is better, Shakespeare as a writer or Mozart as a composer? And then something about incomparability seems very natural. But suppose we ask who's better, um, Shakespeare as a, as a writer or me as a composer? Um, and the answer is very clear. So it's not as if we're unwilling, in, you know, as a matter of principle to compare across these very different things. Um, so I wonder if your system has the resources to allow for such comparisons when, the, when Euclid's uh, principle can't do any work because it's not about subsets of events or areas. So for instance, I may be uh, much more confident uh, that it's gonna rain tomorrow in Tel Aviv than uh, that uh, Trump will be the president for a second term. Um, seems to me like a, an important desideratum of a theory of credence and maybe also of probabilities, although I know less about it, to generate this result, can you? Yeah, so uh, let me just say, the, the thing about the Euclidean principle is I think that it's inviolable for an acceptable theory. It is not very strong, as you say. It really only applies in these cases where, as it were, the, the truth conditions for one proposition are a proper subset for another. And, and outside of that, it just doesn't, it doesn't have any application, okay? The, 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 the thrust of the paper is where it does have an application, you really have to, you, you, you really have to, uh, you know, attend to it and, and, and recover it. In, in, in your case of comparing 
Mozart and you and Shakespeare. I completely agree with you, right? Uh, I, I, I certainly, the, the thing, the scheme has the ability to represent those judgments. That is the Shakespeare Mozart one is incomparable and the both Shakespeare or, or Mozart to you is comparable. <laughs> um, and sure, I mean, that's just something you can, you, you know, you can represent using these relations. Why, the next question is, well, but why are we so sure that Shakespeare was a better writer and Mozart a better composer than you are a composer? And look, I don't know you and I don't want to dis, you know, be dismissive or anything, but it just seems like a- Trust, yeah, trust me on this one. Um, <laughs> and, but of course, I don't get that out of the Euclidean principle. Absolutely not, I can't. Um, then you, you, know, you have to then look subject matter by subject matter to understand the rationale when there is one that people have for making the judgments they do and for refusing to make judgments where they refuse to. Uh, and I don't think, I, of course, I don't think there's any universal principle that's gonna tell you how to do that. That's a matter of learning, um, you know, learning about the subject matter and so on. Right, no, but this is not just about the Euclidean principle. The question is about your view, the, the one that does without numbers. Does it have the resources to yeah, generate, so, say the so probability? Let me, uh, let me just repeat what I said at the end. I, I mean, and in the paper, what I do is throw out Kolmogorov and then bring him back. <laughs> and the way you bring him back, you, the way you bring back these Kolmogorov functions is you deny that they can be really foundational. And, and this is, I guess, you started out talking about models where I guess you don't think anything's foundational. Um, I tend to think, yeah, there are models that have limitations, but, but then I want things, you know, I certainly aspire to have things that don't have those limitations. Um, where there are functions, Kolmogorov functions, like take, take the area function on a disk, uh, which is, and normalize it to one where there will be measurable sets and there won't be re measurable sets using the usual thing that's called a Lebesgue measure. Um, yes, you can use that in that in this case to make judgments about how likely it is the dart will land in different regions where those regions are Lebesgue measurable. Um, however, the, the claim is what I just said. If the judgment is that one region has a larger measure than the other, then you should conclude that that landing in the larger region is more likely. Where they have the same measure, you shouldn't reach any conclusion at all. You should. But what about my example? Uh, I, I'm. Can you can you make sense of? I am much more confident that it will rain tomorrow in Tel Aviv than that Trump will be the president for another four years. Sure. Can, can you make sense of how? Uh, well, first of all, I would just, if you ask me, I don't know you see might make sense of. I mean, if you offered me two tickets, right, again, that gave the same prize, one if Trump is, is president for a second term and one if it rains in Tel Aviv, I'll take the Tel Aviv any day, right? I won't, I won't delay a second. That's clearly my actual psychological state. You know, but I'm not. Now, if you ask me why, I'll give, go into lots of details about why Trump can't, you know, can't get a second term, and why rain in Tel Aviv is a not uncommon occurrence. I, you know, I, I'm not. You know, is there some, what's really puzzling you about my judgment there? And it's not clear to me. And shall do stop me if you have. Um, it's not clear to me what sense can be made on your on your uh, alternative model or way of thinking about these things. Of the comparison, it's not it's not a Euclidean comparison. The, the Euclidean no. principle does not apply. Right. Um, I don't care about the psychology either. Right. The question is about what it would be rational to believe, or how rational it would, uh, or how confident would it be rational to be of these two propositions, or yeah. something along these lines. Now, the number model, with all of its problems, at least makes sense of that. It gives a straight answer to the question. Uh, what's going on there. And I have yet to understand how your model does something similar. That doesn't mean you can't, it just means that I don't yet see how. No, but let me just say, I, I, think, you're, I think you're being misled by something. Um, obviously, the reason I think it's more likely it'll rain tomorrow in Tel Aviv has to do with uh, statistics, which I, I think I probably get more or less right about how often it rains in Tel Aviv. Um, 
it's I can't talk about statistics in a in an electoral situation like this. We've never had one before, but I could go into lots of details about what would have to be overcome for Trump to right. be reelected. Um, the, the, the grounds for my much higher confidence I could articulate in a very clear way. You, you say, oh, I know because I have the numbers. And that, that just presses the question, how did you stick numbers on it? I mean, I can't stick a, an exact number on how likely I think it is going to be to rain in Tel Aviv tomorrow. And I certainly can't stick an exact number on how likely I think it is that Trump would get a second term. I don't know what those numbers would be. I know that it rains. It's not unusual for it to rain in Tel Aviv. I mean, by unusual, I mean, it happens many times in a year. Um, right. And, 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 you know, if I were to go into what would have to happen for Trump to be, to, to get a second term, I, I mean, anybody would judge that's much less likely. I don't think the numbers are doing you any good because then your question is, where did the numbers come from? And you're going to be stuck with the same thing. Why are you giving a higher number to this than that? And you're now going to say the same story. Well, it rains in Tel Aviv, you know, reasonably often and blah, 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 blah. Those stories will be identical. I just won't, I will end the story saying, therefore, this is more likely than that, not therefore I will assign a higher number to this than that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think it's actually quite, clear. Uh, Danny? Uh, thanks. Um, I'll try to start the video. Um, I agree that with your claim that if you're trying to model something that inherently only have a, an order relation, then uh, you don't have to use a numerical system for that. Just use an order relation to do that. And it sounds reasonable that uh, when you speak about subjective uh, probabilities, maybe all we have is an order relation between them. And the numbers are uh, uh, fictional in that sense. But uh, when it comes to objective probabilities, uh, I'm not sure all we have is a, an order relation. Uh, and of course, there are problems with uh, Kolmogorov system, but uh, 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 most of them uh, uh, appear when we are willing to accept that there are infinitely many events. And if we're willing to do that, then uh, I find it hard to, to object to uh, adding infinite, infinitesimals to the numerical system. Uh, it's not a, a trick or a cheat or something like that. It's uh, expanding or improving Kolmogorov system in order to deal with these uh, scenarios. Um, and I think uh, uh, some of your intuition uh, that uh, came up from your examples is a bit misleading because uh, I'll, give, I'll give a different example. Uh, if you look at uh, two athletes running and I'll ask you uh, who has, uh, whose uh, acceleration is greater? Uh, maybe you would be able to say uh, uh, athlete A uh, has a greater acceleration. And I'll ask you, uh, uh, what is the acceleration? And you say, I don't know. It's, it's, it's very hard for me to, to, to give a numerical number for that, uh, numerical value. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it has an actual value. So I think uh, uh, something similar goes for objective probabilities. Maybe it's difficult to give the, the uh, actual numbers, but uh, that doesn't mean that they don't exist. And uh, I think that uh, uh, the fact that we're using probabilities in so many areas uh, to calculate uh, uh, specifically uh, different uh, objective probabilities and draw conclusions from them and, uh, and uh, use them in machine learning, in computer science, et cetera, shows how valuable is to have a numerical system and not just an order relation. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, my comment is that uh, I wasn't convinced that uh, uh, your argument uh, applies to objective probabilities because I'm not convinced there is a, merely an order relation and, and no numerical values. Okay, uh, sorry. I, I just want to, so, uh, let me just say, look, that's obviously the, the in a way, the, the, the most, uh, maybe the most surprising claim I made, which I did not do anything to defend, 
is that even in the case of objective chance, there are incomparabilities. And the existence of incomparabilities is what rules out using any numeric system, including hyperreals and surreals, because they're a completely ordered field. All right. So if I even even if I go to infinitesimals for any pair of surreal numbers, one is they're either equal or one is greater than the other. And I want to claim that that's not always true for objective chances. Now I, I'm going to give you an example. Um, I guess I'm right here. I'm going to give you an example. Again, this, this is I, I'm prepared for this, and since everybody is free to leave, just feel free to leave. Um, of, of why that is. So, and this does depend, of course, on there being an infinite number of possible events, right? If, you, if you're a strict finitist and you don't think there are any real infinities, you're not gonna run into this problem. But let me just describe what the problem is. So again, imagine we're throwing a dart at a, at a circular dartboard. Uh, it's not even really, well, let's just say that all the points are equally likely to be hit. That makes it easy. Okay, so we can also, uh, have propositions about certain regions being hit. Okay, so here's my here's my dartboard. Uh, I mean, let's say I know it's it's going to hit somewhere in here. Go up to to actually that's probably not very easy to see. Here. It's in a darker. Yeah, that's better. Okay, so go up to twelve noon and draw in this radius. We'll just leave out the center. So there's some chance that the that the dart will land along that radius. Yeah. <clears throat> and now move one unit. If if this is this is one unit, one radius unit, move one unit along here, find that point. Oh, it should be further along. I guess it's going along too. Uh, draw in that radius. You move another unit, find that point, draw in that radius. Move another point, another unit. Now, because it's you know pi to go all the way around, this is going to come a little short. Uh, rinse and repeat a denumerably infinite number of times. Okay, so you just go one unit, two units along, three units along, four units along. Each time you'll draw in a new radius. You'll never hit any point that you've already gotten to because pi is not a rational number, okay? So I'm gonna have this kind of, this fan, it's gonna be dense, uh, but it doesn't contain every single point, right? There, there are lots of points. In fact, by the normal measure, the measure of all these radii taken together is zero. Uh, now, I throw the dart and I say, okay, there's some chance that it will hit one of those radii. Now, think of taking this kind of fan thing and rotating it one unit so that, so that this one rotates into that one, this one rotates, sorry, this one rotates into that one, this one rotates into that one. Each one rotates into the next one along. By the Euclidean principle, the chance that you hit the rotated thing is strictly less because you, you, th this fan of radii rotates into a proper subset of itself. That's a, that's a weird thing to happen, right? It's, it's, it, it's a rigid motion that takes a set into a proper subset of itself, or I can rotate it the other way and take it into a proper superset. So the Euclidean principle tells me that, that this set of points, the chance of hitting this set of points is strictly greater than the chance of, of hitting it if I rotate it one unit this way and strictly less than hitting if I rotate one unit the other way, okay? And I think because that follows from the Euclidean principle, I can't avoid that. Now, question, what if I rotate it only halfway? Okay, what if I rotated half a unit? How should I regard that? Well, I don't think I can reasonably say that 
the chance is exactly the same, right? Because if it's exactly the same when I rotated half a unit, it would then by symmetry have to be again exactly the same if I rotated another half unit, but it's less if I rotate it twice, right? That gets me to the last one. So the only thing to say in that case where, where once I, in the case where I rotated half a unit, I can't apply the Euclidean principle anymore because neither set is a subset of the other. And I think the only thing you can reasonably say is that those objective chances are incomparable. Neither is greater than the other, nor are they equal. Any, any other answer, if you try and insist that it's greater, you're gonna get into trouble. If you try and insist it's less, you're gonna get into trouble. And if you try and insist they're equal, you're gonna get into trouble. The only way to avoid the trouble is to say, even for objective chance, they're incomparability. Now, these only come up as it were, they're not gonna come up in everyday life. They're not gonna come up when doing physics. Okay, these are, you know, these are just sort of funny cases that display this property, but I think it can't be avoided. Now, does this take away my ability to use numbers? Not again, I'm gonna just say this one more time. No, if you've been using Kolmogorov functions successfully, my guess is I'll let you use them exactly as you have been using them with the proviso that you don't pay attention to zeros, right? You don't pay attention when it gives you a probability zero. You don't pay attention when it tells you that the probability of this is exactly equal to the probability of that. That might not be true, okay? The, Kolmogor the only Kolmogorov functions here will give you exactly the same numbers for all of these rotated situations but you can't regard them all as equally probable because again, you can rotate the set into a proper subset. You can rotate the set into a proper superset. But uh, yes, if you had to give up all the use of Kolmogorov functions in physics, uh, you shouldn't do it, right? I mean, it's, they're too useful, but you don't have to. You just have to regard them as not foundational and you have to be a little bit careful about how you use them, right? There are some constraints into when you take them seriously and when you don't. Okay, I think, thank you very much. It was a very long discussion. I think very uh, interesting and there are many people still wanted to ask, but I said that that's enough for, for us. We much over time and uh, I thank, thank you again, Tim, uh, for, for being with us and talking with us uh, from afar. And for uh, the 30 people who were, had enough uh, strength to stay all these two hours with us, I uh, thank you. And for those, that, of course, uh, adding to the discussion, uh, especially for Ori, for his uh, comments. And we'll meet uh, next week and on uh, history of uh, psychology and neuroscience in the USSR with Eli Lambden, who is a postdoc in our institute. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I wish I could be with you, but.